This video is sponsored by Normandy 1998, Ash and Team Valor. Our story resumes fairly late into the evening on the outskirts of Route 204, and though it would usually be encouraging to see our twin heroes making such hardy progress, this is not the case tonight, considering Paul is all alone with a defeated and worn out team. And so this trip is taken in a broody, almost sulky silence, as Paul attempts to put as much distance between himself and Floroma, that meadow, and most of all his stupid brothers, all the while thinking back on his recent string of losses to trainers and Pokemon he should have been able to defeat easily. Over and over again he replays his battles with Maylene, Aaron, and now Ash, trying to look for anything that could have changed the outcome, though in his current mental state he is far from objective, with his emotions clouding his rationale, so this quickly becomes more torture than reflection. In an attempt to get some small reprieve from this, he begins busying himself by idly scanning wild Pokemon with his Pokédex, though there is little to stand out as particularly noteworthy this close to the road at the moment. Eventually he winds up scanning a flock of Starly as they pass overhead to hunker down for the night, with this inadvertently bringing the battle with Ash right back to the forefront of his troubled mind, as he thinks of his discarded Starly, now turned Ash's Star Raptor. Some of the Starly in this flock even have stats significantly above what his former Starly could boast, but obviously, none could hope to match the tamed and trained Pokemon now, not just because Star Raptor would certainly boast an advantage in experience and evolutionary state, but beyond the inherent value of its stats and power, Ash has really somehow found a way to bring out some kind of undeniable, unquantifiable value to empirically mediocre Pokemon using his efforts alone. So why weren't his own efforts rewarded as such? If not more so, the answer couldn't be as simple and stupid as him not being warm and cuddly enough because an incompetent simpleton like his brother was able to pull it off. So why? Suddenly, the flock of flying types scatter, as if sensing the young lilac head boy's mounting fury, forcing Paul to rein himself in as best he can for now, and continue down the route alone, with only his thoughts to keep him company. For now. At least, that is until a new face comes into view, clearly unafraid of Paul's rage, as it glares a challenge at him from out of a pond near the end of the route. Looking more closely, Paul sees the creature as orange fur and is kept afloat by a bright yellow ring around its neck, allowing the boy to easily identify it as a weasel before he even thinks to train his Pokédex on the thing. Though when he does proceed to scan it, he's pleasantly surprised, as the estimates for this thing's abilities are actually pretty noteworthy, causing him to square up with Weasel and agree to battle. Instinctively, he reaches for Grottle's ball in order to easily weaken and catch his new prospect, though as he does, reality sets in. That even if his starter could muster enough strength to fight through its injuries, the rest of his team are still incapacitated, and in his desire to punish them, just as much to escape his embarrassment and dodge a nagging from Nurse Joy, he had neglected to heal them, meaning now he's the one in for punishment if he tries to use them in battle. This thought is accompanied by the mental image of Ash standing against him, while the words of people like Reggie, Riley, and Aaron play through his mind, though instead of offering anything helpful, they just prattle on about love and care this, faith and aura that, causing Paul's scowl to deepen, since he didn't want to hear that rubbish the first time, so why would he listen now? As this happens, Weasel climbs out of its pond and takes a fighting stance up on the bank, making note of the fact that Paul hasn't chosen a Pokemon to take it on yet. Not that it matters, since to it trainers and Pokemon are no different, so it'll just as happily decimate this arrogant human who wandered into its turf, so long as it gets to prove that it's the strongest. And so Weasel rockets towards Paul with the incredible force of a mastered aqua jet, forcing the boy to snap from his reverie and roll to the side before springing back to his feet. All the while, the Shade of Ash follows him, grinning smugly and filling Paul with that overwhelming need to do anything and everything his brother can do but way better. Meanwhile, proving itself to be a tenacious and talented fighter, Weasel changes tack in midair, dropping briefly from Aqua Jet to fire a sonic boom behind its alternate pole, which sees him taken by surprise and blown back. However, roaring that he doesn't need anyone to be the very best, Paul surprises Weasel by launching a counterattack in the form of a lobbed Pokeball that hits the Weasel's center mass, just as it's about to come around for another pass, sucking it inside and forcing it to struggle against the capture device. Unfortunately for Paul, Weasel only allows two shakes before it shatters the ball and returns with a vengeance, this time attempting to mow the boy down with its much faster water gun attack. But having recovered a bit, Paul is successfully able to just stay ahead of the beam of water before rolling under it and attempting to throw something at Weasel again. However, this time the Water Weasel sees through the 1-2 combo of Pauls and bursts up into the air with Aqua Jet to dodge before endeavouring to loop around and slam into its foe to end things. Though as we'll soon learn, what Paul threw was merely a couple of raspberries, having used them to set up a counter snare. As reading Weasel's movements, the purple-eyed youth pretends to be caught dead to rights until the last moment 
at which point he steps to the side, revealing a rather large rock just behind where he had been standing, making this Buizel's unintended new target. The resulting impact is thus much less an aqua jet and much more a wave crash, with the wild water weasel being blatantly unprepared or accustomed to such force and recoil, as it's promptly left stunned and dazed, leaving it open for a critical capture opportunity, which Paul ruthlessly pounces on, hitting Buizel in the small of its back with a pokeball, and watching with very little surprises after only one shake a single large digital star appears over the ball in celebration of the new capture. As Paul stops to catch his breath, he suddenly finds the exhaustion from only a day prior hitting him full force once again, seeing him forced to look over Buizel's summary while flatten his back, as in that moment he cannot even find the strength to sit up. Having already decided he wanted to make a change, Paul has a little trouble selecting Miss Magus as the current weak link, though rather than releasing it, he decides to select it as his first auxiliary Pokemon, placing it on standby in Reggie's care. Briefly, Paul thinks about how his older brother may not appreciate his wordlessly pawning off one of his Pokemon on him, with no prior warning or consultation, but then again, Paul hasn't appreciated very much of Reggie's meddling as of late either. Besides, Miss Magus has failed critically three times in a row, with Weirdy having proven itself a more than suitable replacement, meaning he doesn't need both on his team at once. As for Fira and Scyther, while they are also candidates to be sent back to Veilstone, he is willing to give them each one more chance to prove their worth before he axes them. Then there is Chimcha. Were it not for Blaze, he would have discarded it long ago, but now it has become too pivotal to his rivalries with Ash and Maylene, so for now it can stay, if only so he doesn't have to give that pair the satisfaction of changing his approach with it. Following this bout of brooding and strategizing, Paul at last regains enough stamina to very slowly make his way into Jubilife City and its Pokemon Center, with this allowing him to finally get his team the proper treatment they need, as well as gather some supplies to patch up his own bruises from Buizel, before promptly eating and crashing in the room he has provided for the night. The next morning, after sleeping in far longer than he ever would have under normal circumstances, Paul wakes up refreshed and ready to push east towards Kenlave in their gym, leaving as soon as his team has returned to him all fully healed. Feeling as though his ambition is doubled, he even makes a point to host a team meeting before departing onto Route 218, though performance review could be a more apt term, as this is less about introducing and inducting a new addition to the team, as it is making it clear Paul is unhappy with their performance against Ash, and has already devised a harsher training regimen to ensure that it will never happen again. Used to such things, Paul's veteran team members accept this readily, with even Chimcha showing a bit more enthusiasm than usual, as it is happy Paul decided to keep travelling with it for now despite the chance to swap it out like Miss Magus. Though any hope this choice was born from affection is promptly snuffed out, as Paul informs the chimp it's only still here because he wanted to work more on Blaze. Despite the utter embarrassment of its loss to a human, Buizel cannot deny that it likes Paul's spirit, and so it quickly recognises the two of them are going to make a pretty great pair, as both are harsh, prideful, and belligerent. And with Paul's current disappointment in the rest of his team, he is happy to put some focused effort into Buizel's training, first and foremost, actually helping it get a real mastery of its accidentally learned wave crash through some spars against Chimcha, which is similarly meant to force it to activate Blaze. Scyther and Fira, meanwhile, are tasked with developing greater base speed and attack power as a duo, while Weirdir and Grottle now have a great way to train their endurance and stamina to withstand damage with one another, with Paul even having some hope that the Lost Evolution psyche typing could help Grottle awaken a move he's wanted to learn since he chose it. This efficient, effective, and logical setup proves beneficial to Paul's entire team, as they all quickly show signs of growth, with this being just the rationalization Paul needs to not just cling to his ideals, but double down on them, certain that his way of doing things is working. After all, they've already made it down most of Route 218 in only a day's time. Meanwhile, relatively hot on Paul's heels is our other titular hero, Ash, who worriedly spends his time and effort combing the route south of Floroma to make sure he doesn't overlook his brother. The thought that his exhaustion and depression may have reared back up and that his own twin might be lying unconscious and helpless somewhere worries Ash to no end, with him refusing to stop until he finds Paul, or at least some sign that he's okay. This of course sees him rely on his friends, though his overtly best option for the task is the one who will dislike it most, since when he releases and expresses to Star Raptor what he wants it to do, the cool bird shoots him a look that says, did you somehow miss my big emotional epiphany and turning point yesterday? As the predator bird really meant it when it decided it was done with Paul. Truthfully, Ash can more than understand this sentiment, as he admits to his fly that what Paul has done is so cruel, vain, and selfish that he's never wanted to deck him in the face more than he does now. But no matter what, Paul isn't just his brother, he's his friend too, and he won't give up on him or his Pokemon either, and right now, he's really worried about them, but can't do anything for them on his own. Sighing, Staraptor quickly relents and waves Ash off to stop his pleading and give it some takeoff room, though its expression clearly states that it's doing this for Ash, Firo, and the rest of Paul's Pokemon. 
not for Paul. It then shoots off into the air and begins circling up above, much to the apparent wonder of Riolu, who has shown an aversion to travelling in its Pokeball, and so has taken its place at Ash's side. This showing makes Riolu even more determined to distinguish and prove itself as cool and useful just like Staraptor in whatever ways it can, but right now, the best it can do is be a second set of very curious eyes that are after all, still just now seeing the world with them for the very first time. However, Riolu is not the only one looking at the world through new eyes, as every now and then, the link between it and Ash causes Ash to see brief and disorienting flashes of what Riolu sees, as one moment he'll be calling for his brother and checking up in the air for directions from Staraptor, and then he'll find him himself looking from the much smaller perspective of Riolu at his own back, or in some small nooks and crannies where other Pokemon are hiding, sleeping and relaxing, with this inadvertently jump scaring Ash more than once, until he finally deems it a good idea to just let Riolu sit on his shoulders for now until they better figure out that little trick. However, just as they resolve the double side issue, they seem to stumble into trouble, as one of the forest denizens Riolu disturbed in an attempt to help comes back for revenge, that being a flock of Zubat who swarm around the pair. Recognising the danger from above, Staravda attempts to come and put an end to this rowdiness around its trainer, but before it can, Riolu reveals a solution of its own, as to Ash's shock, the newborn Pokemon quite masterfully begins to glow with that blue energy Riley called Aura, and condenses into a bright little ball between its paws before thrusting them out. Having not expected this, several Zubat are struck head on, disrupting the flight of the entire swarm and causing them to disengage and deem the battle not worth the effort despite their number and type advantage, with the speed of their retreat more than doubling when Staravda lands behind Riolu and Ash menacingly. However, in that moment, the boy doesn't even notice, being too wrapped up in what Riolu just did, as even if it has egg moves like Reggie taught him about, a newly hatched baby Pokemon shouldn't be able to do something like that as the move looked even more powerful than that vacuum wave attack Maylene's Riolu used, and it was way older and had more training. This only increases the mystery surrounding the baby Pokemon, though when Ash looks to it for answers, he finds it just as immature and uncoordinated as it usually is, once again putting Ponyta's baby phase to shame. Oh well, whatever happened, it sure was cool, and even if he doesn't understand it yet, he's sure they'll get a handle on it sooner or later, though for now they need to continue their search, and maybe do some practice with this Aura Vision shifting technique as they do. Meanwhile, despite having once again pushed all his Pokemon fairly hard on the way, when Paul arrives in Candelave City, he doesn't bother to stop at the Pokemon Center, instead heading straight for the gym, his confidence having returned a bit, making him want to challenge himself. After all, at least Grottle, Weirder and Weasel still have enough strength to battle. As he enters the gym, he sees it as a fairly laid-back, almost lazily decorated place, as it has no overt decorations or iconography to denote the gym leader's type specialty, with the only thing that seems to be given any focus being the battlefield. Currently, two men are occupying it, one with a bright red afro dressed in warm colours who is commanding a flareon, and the other having shaggy electric blonde hair and a referee's uniform using a jolteon. However, when they see their guest, the two men instantly end their battle and rush into position to greet Paul, their guilty expressions making it seem as though they've been up to something they weren't supposed to. Not really caring one way or the other as long as he gets a battle and a badge, Paul introduces himself and makes a challenge which the red-haired man who introduces himself as Flint the Candelave City Gym Leader happily accepts, while his referee, who introduces himself as Volkner, asks how many badges and Pokemon Paul has. At the answer of three badges and a full team, meaning this at least needs to be a three-on-three, three, both men blush and look at each other nervously, as Flint admits that it's a funny story. See, he and Volkner are actually old travelling buddies and rivals, so on a lot of days when they're waiting on challenges, they pass the time by having battles with Flint's main team, since Volkner has been in talks to take up the position of Sunny Shore Gym Leader when the current one steps down next season. Though since it's been a slow weekend, they've kind of gone overboard, and now most of Flint's Pokemon are really worn out, meaning at the moment, the best he could actually offer Paul is a 1v3 against his only fresh Pokemon, though if it's any consolation, that one is his ace. Saying it's unprofessionalism putting a dampener on his plans, Paul accepts the 1v3, though is incredibly surprised when the Pokemon Flint reveals is an Infernape, and a very healthy and well-trained one at that by the looks of things. Despite it being suboptimal as a tactical choice, Paul cannot pass up this opportunity, and so chooses Chimchar, as Volkner calls for the match between the first and final stage to begin. Wanting to make up for the power difference, Paul decides to rely on good old-fashioned type advantage by calling for Dig. Though unfazed, Flint simply asks for a Mark Punch, with Infernape suddenly becoming a blow of motion, only to put all its force behind its fist, which is buried into Chimchar's face before it can burrow into the ground. Briefly, Paul's heart rises in his chest, as this should definitely be enough to trigger Blaze. Though while this would be true if Chimchar were at full strength, because he intentionally kept it in a weakened state to increase the likelihood of its effect activating, it is instead simply knocked out in a single hit, causing Paul to scowl. Talk about pathetic.
Over with Flint, he and his fire starter are just as surprised by this abrupt end, having held nothing back as a sign of respect for the first stage's fiery fighting spirit, though in a testament both to Infernape's speed and its compassion, it hastily leaps across the field to catch Shimchar before it can hit the ground, and gently places it down to avoid further damage. Furrowing his brow, Flint asks Paul if everything is okay, while telling Volkner to take a look at Shimchar just in case. But before he can, Paul coldly returns the monkey, obviously angry, though this time at least he refrains from admonishing it since that loss was a result of bad battle prep on his part, rather than Shimchar's own weakness. Nonetheless, he does not hesitate to harness the rage rising in him, deciding to fight smartly and cruelly, with his next choice reflecting this as Buizel makes its way onto the battlefield, with a smug but serious glint to its eye. Since Paul is so sure Flint will employ the same mark punch opener, he swiftly orders an aqua jet to dodge, before countering with a full power wave crash. Though hanging tough, Inferno protects its head and chest from this powerful attack with a cross-armed guard, and then at Flint command, its hands begin to crack with electricity, which travels through the water and into Buizel, stunning it even before Infernape actually lands the Thunder Punch that seems far too powerful from Paul's point of view. Seeing this look of bewilderment, Flint seems to put things together and explains his Infernape's ability as Iron Fist, unlike most with Blaze, so all its punching moves have extra power. Now that he's thinking about it, that must have been what Paul was going for with Chimchar, though for what it's worth, as a fire specialist and a former Chimchar trainer, he can tell him now he'd be better off dropping that strategy. Unsurprisingly, this only succeeds in ticking Paul off even more as he calls for a snappy water pulse, which Buizel angrily shoots off at Infernape, having learned the move as a replacement for the weaker water gun. However, to in Paul's dismay, Flint decides to show off a little here by having Infernape negate the move with a super strong fire punch that evaporates the ball of moisture too fast to even leave behind very much steam. Though, this does give Paul an idea, as he tells Buizel to keep this up, with Flint in turn repeating his own move, resulting in the same outcome, not that Paul minds, as when Flint and Infernape get all too comfortable with his routine, the boy changes it, calling for a surprise sonic boom, causing Infernape's fire punch to connect with what is effectively a burst of compressed air, which instantly ignites and expands with explosive force, knocking Infernape off balance to Int and Flint's shock. However, their attention is on the wrong place, as by the time it tries to brace and recover, Buizel has already initiated the very same finishing move it tried to make Paul into a paste with, though with guidance from its new trainer, it is far more likely to hit, as Buizel uses Aqua Jet to soar above the battlefield and up into the warm steamy air collected there, allowing the water weasel to gather far more moisture and therefore power as it converts the move into another powerful wave crash that slams Infernape into the ground and decisively ends the battle, with Buizel triumphantly standing atop the defeated Simeon. With the terms established, this means a victory for Paul, and so a bit embarrassed and admittedly fed up with the cold-hearted boy, Flint awards him the Kindle Badge, and without as much passion as before wishes Paul and especially Chimchar luck in the Pokemon League as Volkner joins him, doing a better job of hiding his dislike for this kid. Mirroring Buizel, Paul thanks the Candlelave City gym leader with a smug wave as the duo leave, and Paul begins charting out the next step with the map on his Pokédex. Now without the burden of Ash slowing him down, he can keep doing things in the most logical and straightforward way possible, and to this end, makes the decision to try and charter boat rides to the site of his next two gym battles, as they are both port cities, quickly determining that knocking off Snowpoint next is his best course of action. As Candlelave is a great shipping hub, Paul quickly finds luck, and his winnings from battles along with his half of the starting allowance Reggie gave him and Ash will be more than enough to cover his boarding fee for a while. The only downside to this plan is that he's having to sacrifice training, as he won't be able to do much on the boat, though considering the reduced travel time, he's willing to accept this trade-off, and so settles in for a boring trip, only to lock eyes with a familiar face as he ascends the gangplank onto the boat, the self-proclaimed aura guardian Riley who along with his trusty Lucario, blinks in surprise and recognition at seeing Paul. Shocked by Paul's separation from Ash, Riley questions the other twin on this, especially considering the momentous occasion, though this causes Paul to raise an eyebrow in obvious questioning, and seeing he is somehow unaware, Riley informs him that a day ago, he and Lucario were able to sense Ash's real Lu finally hatching from the egg he gave him. He then smilingly adds that while psychic powers and aura are not exactly the same, their energies are similar enough that he was able to sense Paul's weird ear evolve as well, and just as proudly, he congratulates the young Sinnoh native on keeping a truly ancient tradition of this land alive. This news comes as a mild surprise to Paul, as this new addition to Ash's squad means their teams are still equal in number, at least for now but overall he is not very invested. Though, thinking back on the match with Ash a final time, this connection to the Aura Pokemon serves as a decent enough explanation as to how that dope bested him. However, now he needs to know something far more important. 
moment, with us seeing him level a serious glare at Riley as he asks him how to beat someone with aura, an answer the Guardian is more than capable of giving. Meanwhile, as Paul and Riley sail away, Ash at last arrives in Canelave thanks to his team's growing tracking skills, and as the boy looks out at the harbour town, he is more determined than ever to reunite with his brother. And that's where we'll leave things. What secrets of aura will Paul learn during his boat trip with Riley? Can Ash and Riolu master their own? And when will the brothers' paths cross once more? Find out as the journey continues.